There you go. Life isn't that bad now. Hallelujah. Glory. Uh, we're back again. Talk to Pastor Bronk. We had a good talk today. A real good talk. I think he preached last night. He, in his own humble words, he tore it up. Anyway, he always does. But uh, they, they've had a good time. Uh, a real good time. We had a good talk. Probably 10, 15 minutes. He's doing good. He's bragging about the 57 degree weather over there. Which, yeah, uh, makes me sick to my stomach. I told him I heard, I heard through uh, a certain weatherman on Fox that due to climate change, I was hoping there would be a heat index of about 130 in Tulsa to make me feel better about myself because he's there. But uh, he's having a blast. Uh, the meetings are going great. And good attendance. and Amen. I'm sure he'll come back on fire. Amen. I'm happy to be here. Um, real happy. I just want, before I start out, there's a couple of things. I am, I heard the message from Sunday. I, I do that a lot. I, believe it or not, some of you might not agree with me or not, but I got a lot of calls from out of state. Some people that wanted to show the part about Luke 35, the Luke 6, 35 and 38, they wanted to present it to their congregation. Obviously, the cry of racism is everywhere nowadays. He said, but I got a lot of calls from African Americans. They said, we want to share this at our church. And, it, and that's good. That's good. Because it's not just an African American issue. It's a Hispanic issue. It's a Caucasian issue. It's just a corporate issue. But nobody talks about it because they're one-sided about it. But I can talk about it because I don't have a racist bone in my body. I used to. I used to have a racist, racism ruling me because I was real ignorant of the truth. And really what made me ignorant was because I used to like, and my wife knows, I used to like a Caucasian girl in high school. But because I was dark and brown, I wasn't good enough for her. But anyway, that, and that caused me a little bit to be, I held a whole race bondage because of one man that didn't like me. That's pretty dumb, isn't it? I know none of you said yes, but anyway, that's pretty ignorant. That's you. How ignorant can you be? My pastor now is an old country boy, and uh, I got four or five awesome friends in Alabama that I drove 12 hours to spend a weekend with, and the Averitts and their mom, and we have a blast, and I love them so much. Shout out to them. But uh, I can talk about these things. I don't care if my own people get mad at me for speaking the truth. I don't care. If I'm going to get mad because people get mad at me for preaching the truth. I need not pick this microphone up. But I'm not scared to tell the truth. Uh, I've learned the last couple of years that I've, my scope has broadened. I don't just stay in one book anymore. I do, but I rotate books day after day because it gets easier to understand an epistle when you understand another one. It's good to stay in the same epistle, but man, it's even better when you go here for a day, and then you go to Titus for a day, and then you go to Thessalonians for the day, they, 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 they parallel each other tremendously. And I've been in the five T's in the Thessalonians and Timothy and in Titus. I've just been just consuming them. I feel the need to really comprehend the book of Timothy because it teaches me how to treat people in the church from the elders to the mothers to the young ladies to the widows. It's teaching me everything. It teaches me the qualifications, what it means to be a bishop or a deacon. It teaches me the qualifications. You know, funny enough, when it lists the qualifications of a deacon or a bishop, you know one thing that they do not list? Think about it now. What's one of the qualifications that Paul gives to Timothy on what a deacon or bishop must do. And that's what? Give it a shot. Go to church. He never tells them a bishop or a deacon must go to church. You know why? Because when a person meets those qualifications, you don't have to tell them to go to church. <laughs> they go because they're in love with God. So I find it real hard to understand why people... It's, it's amazing to me. It really is. 
you know, you pray all week long and you spend time with Jesus. Man, you want to go hear the word of God. Yes, I know we get tired sometimes. Yes, I understand that. But my God, he didn't say attend church because if you do all the qualifications of a deacon, you're going to be in church. Amen? So that's just some of the stuff he's showing me. Nothing big, just observations. But uh, I want to start this evening by reiterating, not reiterate, but just bring clarity. Some of the things I said Sunday. Um, I heard it. Uh, uh, Miss Candy heard it and loved it. And one of my mentors or elders, Barry Johnson, Loved it. Somebody from Louisiana loved it. Alabama got a lot of calls and text messages, which was good. I know some of the things were different than what you've heard, but uh, I quoted Titus 2, and I quoted 1 Timothy chapter 4, chapter 5. If there was an exception with what I said, I, I urge you, open up your Bible and meditate it more than once, and you'll see what I saw. Amen? But I do want to bring clarity I did make a mistake regarding, and you know what I figure? I figure if I'm not if I'm not scared to say that I'm wrong, then I'm saying I got room to grow. If I'm hard pressed to tell you that I'm wrong, then I'm saying I know it all, and I do not. So I admit it was nothing big, but I did make an error. My wife said, don't worry about it. People aren't even going to know what you said. I said, yeah, but I know what I said. So I see this. I'm, I'm not immune from being wrong. I'm not. And my friend called me today from Texas and said, you, I heard what you said about racism and I loved it, but you, let, you, you said something wrong. I said, okay, well, let me hear it. I didn't argue, contend. I said, let me hear it. They said, you said that the white, and I say white to make it dramatic, just to let you know what was at stake. The Caucasian police officer, you said that her best friend was next to her, which was a deputy. That was not her best friend. It was just a deputy fixing her hair. I said that it was her best friend sitting next to her in the courtroom. It was not her best friend. It was just a deputy that after hugging people and stuff, her hair was messed up, and the African-American deputy helped. The Caucasian officer fix her hair. That's the correction. But I had to correct it because I knew it was truth. And now with clarity, I tell you the truth. And by the way, if you guys get a chance, you need to go hear the testimony of the judge in this matter. What a powerful testimony of this judge. She said, I, she said this, I am a Christian. I am commanded to be merciful and compassionate. What a testimony. He says, I'm commanded to be merciful and compassionate. African American judge, Caucasian deputy, African American deputy next to her, and the world cries racism. It's amazing to me. Enough of that. So I brought clarity to that. Another thing that I want to bring clarity on is. It is not a sin for a woman to have a profession at all. The point I was making according to Titus chapter 2 is that if her profession or her schooling or what she esteems higher as an honor to serve her husband and her children, that is idolatry. That's when it has become wrong. That's, that's when it becomes wrong. There's nothing wrong with a woman having a profession. If she can work, go to school, etc., and tend to her home, to her children, love her husband, love her children, be discreet, chaste, there's nothing wrong with it. I think I explained that, but I just want to reiterate in case there's any doubt, and vice versa with husbands. We sometimes, we pressure our wife, go, go work, get this overtime, go, go, we need a bigger car, we need a bigger house. That's idolatry on the husband's part. Women aren't just piece of meat just to get another zero at the end of the week. That's not the way it's done in the Bible. There's an order, and Titus 2 gives us that order. Amen? I just want to bring clarity to that. It is not wrong at all. My wife works. I tell you one thing, but we're working now, making some adjustments where she said, Honey, if we sell our, we got equity in our home. Honey, if we sell our house, I'll live with you in a, in a one bedroom apartment. Hey. I'm just tired of her working. 
And so is she. She's worked her whole, from picking tomatoes at the age of 11 and 12 in the heat in Johns Island, South Carolina, to working her whole life, her whole life. And it breaks my heart. And in, in, in due time, I'm going to sell my home. I have equity. And we got to rent a one-bedroom apartment. I could care less. I just... She drives that old truck out there. I said, honey, we can try to get another vehicle. No, that's fine. It's paid for. We don't owe nobody on it. So it's got more dents than, it's got a lot of dents. It's got new tires, though. But she's content. She's content. And she said, the AC works good. But uh, she's, she's, you know, we could go get us another little car and with a modest payment. We could do that. But no, that truck's fine. So we're going to run it to the ground. Amen. But life is good. Uh, I, again, I just, as elders, there's elders here, I, I would urge you, I can't command you, familiarize yourself with the book of Titus. It gives the order in the church of how to treat elders, how not to rebuke an elder, how to reverence mothers in the faith, you know, Terry, Barbara, the, the elderly woman, mature in, in, in statue in God, and Sister Payne, and you know, Yolanda, these mothers in the faith, to reverence them, and the young ladies, not as a piece of meat, but as sisters. You know what I'm saying? There's order in the books of Timothy. There's order in there. It's an order that we are to live by. There's fathers here in the faith. There's fathers, elderly men, that, that bring wisdom. Somebody, somebody rebuked me slightly after church Sunday in a good way. She said, I never want to hear you talk bad about that you're ignorant and not very smart. She told just like that. It's, I ain't gonna tell you what she said. It was a, it was a, it was an awesome compliment she gave me. So I said yes, ma'am. I'll never say again that that I'm not that smart and this and that. So I, I promised her. But as a mother, she told me this, and I had no right to respond, and I didn't. I said yes, ma'am. I will never call myself ignorant or not smart again. Okay. So that was that. I mean, I, and I took it. I didn't know what she was gonna say. On the other half of the statement, but she said, I don't ever, I guess she pointed her finger. How do I know, right? <laughs> Never want you to call yourself ignorant and have a low self esteem again. I said, okay. And then she said, why? But I can't tell you why. But uh, there's order. There's, or don't just stay in the same book all the time. Read about, read the structure in 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy. Do you know 1 uh, and 2 Timothy? I'm not going to touch on that, just exhort them a little bit. You know what they are, really? Books of sound doctrine. 1 Timothy chapter 1, Paul says, I charge thee. He says, I charge thee to remain at Ephesus. Many are falling away from the soundness of doctrine, giving themselves to vain janglings about the law. Notice what Paul said. He said, the end of the commandment or sound doctrine is this. Charity. Out of a pure heart. Out of a good conscience. Of unfeigned faith. Meaning, you live according to Christ is in you. And you're going to walk according to sound doctrine. People are, fors People are forsaking this basic thing in the kingdom of God. They're forsaking love. Out of the pure heart, out of a good conscience, and out of unfeigned faith. They're de deviating from that, Timothy. But I charge you, remain at Ephesus. And whatever I taught you, don't you add and don't you take away. Because they didn't have the book of 1 Timothy before they had a born-again spirit. That came first, then the book of 1 Timothy came. So they had the capacity through Christ in them to walk in silence of doctrine because they could obey Christ in them. Amen? So he charged them, he's charged him, remain at Ephesus. And whatever I taught Timothy, do not deviate from that. Don't add and don't you dare take away. This is sound doctrine. I charge you, implement it, correct, rebuke, exhort with the word of God. And when he finished 1 Timothy, in chapter 5, he said again, I charge thee. To keep that which was committed unto thee. What was committed unto Timothy? Don't depart from Ephesus. And I charge thee. And I ask thee. You stay there. And you make sure that they are not departing from sound doctrine. This is what I charge you with Timothy. This is what I've asked you to keep. Go make sure the foundation is not flawed. I thank God more than ever. 
more than ever. I have always known that praying in the Holy Ghost was for edification, exhortation, and comfort. I've never argued that. I, I believed back then that it is the only true way for true revelation knowledge. I believe it now times a hundred more than ever. You cannot, you cannot, you cannot get a full comprehension of the scripture without the Holy Ghost and without our prayer language. I will take that to the bank. But I still stand firm, though, that you can't walk in lasciviousness or you can't walk a according to a computer and, and flirt on your wife and pray in tongues and think you're okay. That's not biblical. That is not biblical. I had a guy that called me a while back recently and said, um, yeah, I, I, I started back again. I'm drinking. I'm, I'm doing crystal meth, but I'm praying in tongues. Are you dummy. You dummy. So the few minutes of self-edification is going to justify and give you permission to indulge in drugs, but you're praying in the Holy Ghost? Your first level of mortification is obeying Christ in you, man. You obey that, and then you stop doing the drugs. It, it's, we have to get over that mindset. I'm doing this, I'm doing that, but I'm praying in tongues. That, that's good. But you're going to use that excuse to the day that you die. Mortification is now at the moment. Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. Adultery, fornication, lasciviousness. Don't do them. We know what mortification is because we're born again. Amen? Amen. So Paul charged Timothy in chapter 1, chapter 5 of 1 Timothy. He said, don't leave Ephesus. Make sure that sound doctrine is being taught. At the end of chapter 5, he says, Keep that which I have committed unto you. Keep what? Make sure they don't deviate from sound doctrine. Amen? Amen. Saying that, I'll say this. I was on a spiritual... You, be, you can be turning to Second Second Thessalonians chapter 1. Second Thessalonians chapter 1. I'll, I'll say this before we get to the teaching. I'll say this. Um... I've been on a spiritual fixing, uh, f fishing expedition lately. Um, I really have, for a good reason. Now I, now I know why I was on this spiritual fishing expedition. I heard a guy that I really like. I really do. I heard. I'm not going to give names at all to anybody, so don't even bother asking me. Um, I heard his understudy. So then I heard a lot about the understudy's father. And I really liked the father of this understudy, of his, son in the, in, of his son in the faith. So I heard some messages from this father of this man. Real good stuff. Some of the stuff he said that I've never heard before. Powerful stuff. Powerful. Really edified me. But I stopped listening to it because I listened to mainly Gary, Pastor Bronk, uh, and... Barry Johnson. Those who I talk to a lot and I listen to them a lot and I always will to the day I die. But uh, I heard this guy and please don't, don't shut your ears up on me and keep your heart open because Paul said to Timothy, I charge thee, man, remain at Ephesus and make sure that they don't deviate from the doctrine that I taught. Then he reminded him again in chapter 5 of 1 Timothy. He said, I charge thee. Keep that which is committed unto thee. What's committed unto thee, Timothy? Make sure they preach sound doctrine. Okay. Keep your heart open with me. Keep your ears open with me. So I went on this fishing spiritual expedition to really hear this man. Not looking for anything wrong in his doctrine, but hearing him and praying in the Holy Ghost. That's all. You just don't hear a good message. You better listen to it. Because... Logic and reasonings are in many messages. And if you're just so excited because they're preaching a powerful message, you might not really listen to the details. I like to listen to the details. And there's another reason why I heard this guy, but I cannot go into it. Me and Pastor Bronk talked about it today. So I heard a few teachings of this guy, and I really liked him. Really liked, and I still do. I still, he says some awesome things that I've never heard. Awesome. But he is the same one that said 
that First John was talking about a Christian that was struggling with love. No, it's not. First John's talking about a man that's born again or a man that is not born again. The same man also, I heard twice out of two separate messages, he said that doctrine is not that important, that love is. That's not what Paul said. He also said that Romans 6 was water baptism. It is not. The baptism of Romans 6 is you have been born again. So there's things that I'm catching. Am, am I going to put him in with a hybrid grace? No. No, I'm not. But those three things are disturbing to me. Because What's next? If Romans 6 is talking about water baptism, then what's next down the road? If uh, he says we put too much emphasis on doctrine, okay, what's next then? If he says 1 John is a, is a Christian struggling with sin and with love, what's next? I hear a lot about love. I hear a lot about love from him. And he is right. He has blessed me with his teachings. He has blessed me. But I never hear about mortification. And if you talk about love all the time and you're limited on your scope about mortification, when you do wrong, you're going to be consumed. Well, God loves me. You're going to do whatever you think. You can. Now, I'm not saying he does. I don't think he does. He's a solid man. I love him. He's got some good stuff, but those three things make me very nervous. What's next? I mean, do you know what I'm saying? Gradually something can come up. What, what is next in his life? So I was wanting to hear, so I'm stopping. I heard what the Holy Ghost wanted me to hear, and that was enough for me. That's enough. It would be a sin for me to hear him again? No, but I was just uncomfortable with those three statements. Because what is next? He says sin has no dominion over you. He does say that. He says a walk with Christ is about holiness and righteousness. He does say that. He does. He doesn't preach hyper grace at all. He loves to worship God. That he does. He loves to spend time with God. He talks about a secret place. That he does. I reverence what he says, but those three things get me nervous because you think to yourself, what's next down the road? Are you with me? So just take that to heart. Consider. And don't just hear the message, but listen to it. It's vital. I'm convinced now more than ever, a hundred times over, that praying in the Holy Ghost consistently, consistently, hour after hour, is the only true way to receive true revelation knowledge. There is no other way. A smart person can somewhat figure it out to an extent, but the very meat of it, they won't figure it out because they're doing it with their very own reasonings and logic instead of having the Holy Ghost, which brings all things to remembrance into their memory. Remember that. I am not coming against it, but those three things that he said, I'm very uncomfortable with. And some of you might know who I'm talking about. Some of you may not. But I stand firm and I cannot apologize for what I'm saying. I cannot and I will not apologize for that. Amen? All right. Let's get on with it. I've been in the church of Thessalonica for about two weeks. First and second Thessalonians been there for about two weeks. Just I, I asked the Holy Ghost. I said, sir, can you... Put me on the front row. I want to, I want to behold the words of God. I want to be there. I just don't want to hear the words of First Thessalonians and Second Thessalonians. I want to be there at that church. I want to be there at that meeting. I want to have my eyes fixed on on Paul. I want my eyes fixed on the doctrine of the kingdom. I I, I want to Lord. I don't want to preach this, Lord. I want to live it more than ever. And if I'm able to preach out of how I live, that is what I'm looking for. Correct me, Lord. Put stripes on my back. Chastise me, Father. Show me my wrong. Show me the subtlety that's inside of me. Show me, Father. Break me. Break me. Break me down. Show me. Tell me. Chastise me. Lay stripes on my back. That's what I want. That's my, that's my heart cry. In the kingdom of God. I want to be a bond servant. I don't care. You can call me a. a I don't consider myself a pastor. I'm just Pastor Bronx associate. I mean calling me a revivalist. That's fine. It's not a sin. But I just want to esteem. I just want to 
handle my life as a bond servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Nothing else really means anything to me. If I'm a bond servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, walking in his power and virtue, it's going to happen. There's nothing that can hinder that from happening. Amen. If I commit my life to the gospel and I present my body as a living sacrifice, it's going to happen. And talking about mortification, the very first message that's basically recorded in the New Testament is Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And Jesus talked about mortification. Jesus, perfection, the hundredfold, talked about mortification. He said, if your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and cast it. This is Jesus now. The Son of God. Perfection on legs. All mercy, all compassion talked about mortification. If your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and cast it from thee. He said, if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from me. Colossians 3 talks about mortification. Romans talks about mortification. 1 Corinthians chapter 9 talks about mortification. 1 Peter chapter 4 talks about mortification. The Bible was filled with a mortification message. It's Galatians talks about mortification, about being crucified with Christ. The Bible is a doctrine of life in Christ, but it is teachings of mortification. How can, not, how can it not, not be in our forefront? How can it not be in our mouth? It's written in the Bible. You can't please God without walking in mortification. Mortification is, Father, no matter what I feel, no matter what's at stake, no matter how much pressure is on me, Father, I'm going to live according to Christ in me. No matter what I feel, no matter how many rights I feel I have, I disannul them rights. No matter if someone embarrasses me, Lord, I will mortify that thought and walk in according to Christ in me. Nothing else matters. That is the mortification message. We have no rights. If you try to offend me, did not, is not the cross and the resurrection enough to heal me of that? Is not Christ risen and justifying me in spirit by living? This? Isn't that enough if my wife leaves me tomorrow? If she runs off with another man, is not the cross and the resurrection my sufficiency? If I lose all that I have, if she runs off with my best friend, if my kids go crazy on drugs, if I lose my job, if it's not the cross and the resurrection enough for me to make it till tomorrow? Until the next day, until the next day, that, my friends, is mortification. I don't care what's at stake. I don't care what you've done to me. The cross and the resurrection, Christ in me, is my absolute sufficiency. No matter what I face, man, death, being beheaded, being decapitated, my testimony cannot be for sale. Because if any man be in Christ, he's what? He's a new creature. Old things are past. Behold, all things have become new. Ladies and gentlemen, we do not. We do not receive the grace of God in vain. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 1. We do not receive the grace of God in vain. Well, can you elaborate what God's grace is? Yes, I can. The very last verse of 2 Corinthians chapter 5 tells us what God's grace is. This is the grace that we do not receive in vain. He who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. There's grace. We've been made the righteousness of God through his spirit inside of us. And we do not receive that righteousness, the grace of God, in vain. Nothing moves us. Nothing. I do not receive your grace in vain. You made me righteous. Nothing I did made me righteous. Nothing. I believed that you were disfigured for me. I believe your visage was marred more than any man and your form more than the sons of man. I believe you were ripped to shreds for me. I believe you were disfigured and Isaiah couldn't tell who you were. You were, so, you were a big giant whelp. You were a big mole for me. I was unjust, you were just, you paid the price that I deserved, and you justified me. That, my friends, is a life of mortification because you live out of that incorruptible seed.
I'm telling you. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. We are not to receive God's grace in vain. Again, what's God's grace? That he who knew no sin became sin for us. That we might be made the righteousness of God in him. I'm righteous in him. He is the Christ. He is the perfect one. He is the one that found me in perversion. Perfection found a pervert and ransomed him. That, my friends, is grace. That's what we live by. I will not receive God's grace in vain. He made me righteous through his death and his resurrection. So by God, it's by that death and resurrection that I live. And that's the same grace that you live by. Amen? Amen. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Man. Perversion was made whole by perfection. Think about that. Blasphemer, addicted to pornography, Committed an adultery in my heart, fornicated my whole life, drunkard, cocaine in my system, smoking crack, a lot of it. And yet, at five o'clock in the morning, on drugs, addicted to pornography, at five o'clock in the morning, him who knew no sin became sin for me that I might become the righteousness of God in him. I didn't toil. I didn't labor. I just believed in the grace of God and the gift through grace that his blood redeemed me. That's so simple on my part. But my God, he was shredded to pieces. Isaiah said his visage, his face was marred more than any man. Isaiah 53, his body more than the sons of men. You couldn't even tell what he looked like. He was so disfigured for me, for Rudy, for Terry, for, for Crystal, for my wife. He was so disfigured. Love made him cling to that tree, my friends. Love. Love, love, love. That is the grace of God. The cross and the resurrection are far more than enough. No matter what you say about me, if I don't overcome what you said, it's because I didn't want to, because I still believe that I had rights. My wife leaves me tomorrow and I, I'm torn to pieces and I backslide into the world. It's because I chose not to believe his grace. I chose to be a man of excuse and feel sorry for myself when purity hung on a tree for me. My God, we've missed it. We've missed the true biblical definition of the word faith. We don't have a, con uh, a mindset of what the true faith of God is. We're so wrapped up corporately the body of Christ and logic and reasonings and stuff that makes sense. That's why we retaliate. I put on Facebook the other day, and you know what? This is coming from the church. I put on Facebook the other day, I said, logic says that when a person dies, that God has a, what, I forgot what I put. The what? The final say, so whether one lives or dies. I said, logic says that if someone's going to die, that God has a final say, so whether he lives or dies. I said, my friends, this is heresy. Read your Bible more than once a year. And a Christian said, oh, Pastor Homer, you have so much to learn. I love you. No. <laughs> I thought about it. <gasps> okay, honey, put this on there. No, 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 don't put it, don't put it, don't put it. Put it on there. God bless you. I love you too. Oh, God bless you. <laughs> oh, yes. Hallelujah. I love you. Yes. Blessings to you, sister. But I'm getting it from the church. You get it from the church. When I said the word ignorant the other day, it sounds so mean. Ignorant just means your lack of knowledge. That just means your lack of biblical knowledge. Paul used the word ignorant concerning himself before his conversion into Christianity. He said, I did it in unbelief. I did it in ignorance. Paul thought he was right living for God, but he was ignorant of the truth. 
Then he heard the truth and he made the conversion and he walked in mortification the rest of his life. How do you know? Because he wrote it several times in the Bible. Amen? Amen. So saying that, I say this. I've been in the church of Thessalonica for a couple of weeks. Not physically, you know that, right? Just in spirit, beholding the words of the apostle. Uh, preview, or just a summary, an overview of First Thessalonians. He's writing to the church at Thessalonica. Chapter 1 of First Thessalonians. He's commending them. You don't have to turn there. He's commending them for their labor of faith and love. He's commending them because they turned from idols to the living God. He's commending them. Chapter 2, he goes on to explain to them them being the apostles, they've gone through so much at Philippi, so much persecution. Some of them were even murdered and killed for Christ's sake. And he tells the church at Thessalonica, you're about to go through the same thing. Okay? So then in chapter 3, he says, look, I'm, I'm, I'm concerned about you, so I'm going to send Timotheus. I'm going to send Timothy to you to make sure that you're established because you've you're appointed to trials and tribulation. There's no way around it. You're appointed to them, but I want to make sure I send Timothy to make sure that you are established. So he sends Timothy. Timothy comes back. And after Timothy comes back with the report of the church, that's at Anika, Timothy says to Paul, he says, they're doing good. Paul rejoices twice. Twice. He commends them for their faith. This is the part that took me a while to comprehend. He commends them for their faith. Twice. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. He commends them twice. He says, I see you have faith and you're standing in faith. Something I hadn't seen before. You know what faith is according to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Faith is, are you standing fast in the Lord? Paul made that cut. And dry in First Thessalonians chapter 4. Faith, we've held it. I got faith for a new car. I got faith for a new house. And that cannot be wrong. It's right to an extent. But Paul said, true biblical faith is, are you standing fast in the Lord? And he commends them because they're standing fast in the Lord. And he commends their faith. Then he says something to me that blows my mind. He says, I'm praying. I'm paraphrasing. I'm praying, he says, that God will send me to you. Because you are lacking in your faith. I said, okay, Paul, you've commended them twice in chapter 3 for their faith. And their labor of love. You're commending them. You're saying that now in your afflictions, that you're happy now. Because you hear of their faith, that they stand fast in the Lord. So threw me for a curveball. You're commending their faith. Then you say, I'm praying. I want to get to you. To exhort to you what you're lacking in your faith. So I had a hard time with that. I said, Lord, then if Paul is committing them for their faith, for standing fast in the Lord, then how is he going to add to their faith? Because they're lacking. He explains it at the end of three. Or the end of, at the end of three, he says, look, I pray that you may abound in love more and more and more and more. He commends their love. He commends their faith. Their faith is that they're standing fast in the Lord. But he says, but you're lacking. Lacking where? He said, pray that God will make you to abound in love. But in chapter 4, he tells them how God will make them abound in love. By heeding the commandments and doing them. Love is a growth process, my friends. If not, he wouldn't instruct them. I'm going to come to you and I'm going to give you what you're lacking in your faith. But he commended them for their faith in chapter 3. He said, but I'm going to go because you're lacking in your faith. What were they lacking? He said, I want you to abound yet more and more and more and more in love. Did I explain that to you with clarity? Do you understand where I'm going with this? Okay. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Miss Terry, will you come read this for us, please? Pretty please. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, chapter 1, verse 3 through 5. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet, because that your faith groweth exceedingly, and the charity of every one of you all toward each other aboundeth, 
so that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that ye endure, which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God, that ye may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which ye also suffer. Yes, we'll read the other one later. Okay. That's second this that second this only chapter one verse three through five, right right, Terry? Okay, again. First Thessalonians in chapter one, he commends them for their labor of faith and love. Then he says, I'm gonna come to you. I pray that God open up a door that I, that I want to establish you because you're lacking. Lacking in what? He commended my faith, Paul. What am I like? He said, you got to abound in love more and more and more. And in the next chapter, he said, you please God by keeping the things that we command you from the Lord Jesus Christ. So you grow more and more and more and more and more in the perfect love that lives inside of you. You grow in perfect love when you obey perfect love. Are you with me? You're perfected in the love of God when you obey God's perfect love inside of you. But in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 again, he says the same thing again. In what Terry just read, hopefully I can remember to quote it again. He said, we are bound, listen carefully. Paul says to the church at Thessalonica, he says to Homer, as I visited the church of Thessalonica that day, I visited, I put myself there. Paul is talking to me. He's not, I'm not reading Thessalonica, the, uh, the book of Thessalonians, to preach to you. I'm reading it to get taught. And that by my teaching and by me applying, that I'm able to teach others also. Amen? So he says, we are bound. Chapter chapter. 1 verse 3, we are bound. If I misquote a word, Terry quoted it right there. We are bound to give thanks always unto thee. We are bound always to give, no, we are bound always to give thanks unto thee, brethren. Gosh almighty, I got almost the whole thing memorized. We are bound always to give thanks unto thee, brethren, for it is meat for your faith. Listen to what he said. I'm giving thanks to you because your faith your faith is growing exceedingly. How many of you want your faith to grow exceedingly? Say I. I. He said, I'm writing to you because your faith, it's good that I write to you because your faith is growing exceedingly. And your charity for one another to everyone is abounding towards each other, give or take. I'm writing to you because your faith grows, is growing exceedingly your faith is growing exceedingly and your charity for everyone what is it Terry? and your charity for everyone yeah the charity for every one of you all for each other it abounds you're growing in faith and you're growing in love now you can't grow in faith unless what happens unless you what walk in love Galatians 5 faith worketh by love. So you cannot, you cannot grow in faith. Your faith cannot grow exceedingly lest you put on Christ. Amen? Habitually, my friends. Habitually. He said, I'm writing to you. It's good that I write unto you. It's meat because your faith grows exceedingly. And your charity for what every one of you all, for each other, Aboundeth. He said, so that we give glory for you in the churches of God for your patience and faith in all the persecutions that you what? All the persecutions and trials or tribulations that you what? Endure. Which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God. That he would count you worthy of the kingdom to the which you were called. In which you suffer also. He's saying your faith is growing exceedingly, church, at Thessalonica. Because your love for each other, it abounds. And I glory in you and the churches of God because of your patience and faith. And all the persecutions and tribulations that ye endure. He said, this is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God. It's a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God that he may count you worthy of the kingdom of God in which, what's the word again? In which you what? 
and you in which you also suffer. Now, religion will preach once saved, always saved. But the book of Revelation says that when you get born again, your name is written in heaven. But doesn't it also say that you better stand firm or else your name will be what? Blotted out. Does that sound like eternal security to you? You're saved. You give your life to Jesus. Your name is written in heaven. He said, but you better stand fast or your name will be blotted out of the Lamb's book of life. Now, if it's blotted out, that means what? It was there before. But it got blotted out. Obviously, somebody went wrong. Paul's saying almost the same thing here. He said, forgive me, excuse me. He said, it's good that I write unto you. Because church, your faith, Ralph, Barbara, your faith is growing exceedingly. And your love, Terry, for one another, it's abounding toward each other. So I glory in you, Terry, and in the churches of God for your patience and faith for all the persecutions and tribulations that ye endure. Stop. The word patient is a Greek word, hufamone, 5128. Patience means this. Quality of character which does not surrender during circumstance or succumb under trial. Patience is not a passive word. It means that no matter what duress you're facing, no matter if you're facing decapitation, no matter if you're going to be dipped in hot oil like John, patience is no matter what I face, my wife leaves me, I go bankrupt, I go blind. Patience is this, no matter what I go through, if I get thrown into the lion's den, if I get thrown into a fiery furnace, patience is this, Father, I will not negate Christ in me. I will keep that incorruptible seed. I will not deviate from your word even if it means that I must die for my faith. When we stand in patience, our faith grows exceedingly because the love for one another towards each other, it abounds. If your love for me abounds and my love for you abounds, only one thing can happen, my friend. Our faith will grow exceedingly because we endure. Now, we don't have to endure persecutions and tribulations right now. Correct? Not really. How many of you have been slaughtered or talked about because of your stance in Christ? Really? Say, I, if you have. Right now, what we really face is moods. <laughs> Correct? We face a narrative that contradicts the righteousness of the kingdom. That's really all we face. What the church faces right now, really, is ourself. The very thing that we were delivered from when we got born again. You were delivered from yourself. Amen? You were delivered from yourself the day you got born again. So really, what's kicking our butt and eating our lunch is something that we've been delivered from. The flesh. We've been delivered from the flesh, yet the flesh that we've been delivered from... <coughs> That is what dominates the body of Christ right now. Because we're not facing persecution. We're not facing tribulation. We're not facing martyrdom. Physical martyrdom right now for our faith. The only thing we're facing right now is something that we've already overcome at the rebirth. We're facing ourselves. We're facing a mortal body that has lust. And it wants us. That's all we're facing. Moods. We're facing sexual sin. We're facing alcohol abuse. Drug abuse. Hatred. We're not facing persecution for our faith like the church at Thessalonians was. We're not facing that persecution. But that's good. But guess what? It's coming. It's coming. I'm telling you, it's coming. But even now, even not facing persecution or tribulation, our faith can still grow exceedingly. And our love for each other, it still can abound. Why? When we overcome ourselves. If you don't overcome yourself, the very thing in you that's been defeated, your faith won't grow exceedingly because your love for one another, it will not abound, my friends. But Paul told the church in Thessalonica, he said, man, it's meat, it's good. It's good because your faith is growing exceedingly and your love for one another, it abounds. So that I glory in you and in the churches of God for your patience, for your hufamine, for your consistency, for your
for your patience that you face and the faith that you have in this trial. Faith is you're standing firm in God by being patient, by doing everything you are to do in God. He said, you're going through persecutions, you're going through tribulations, but you endure. How were they enduring the trials and the tribulations and the persecutions? By patience and by faith. You endure. It isn't a passive endure. It's an endure of who fulminate. Lord, I know what they're saying. I know they want me to denote to denounce Jesus Christ, but Father, I've concluded in myself, and I understand that Jesus was disfigured for me. I understand that he was shredded and torn to pieces for me. I understand, Lord, Isaiah 53, the atonement. I understand this, Lord. I understand his grace. And I was dead, Lord, in my trespass. But innocence came and revived me and made me righteous. I understand the stripes on your back, Lord. I understand the penalty you paid for my transgression. I don't live unto myself, Father. I live unto you. If that means that I got to face death for the cross, Lord, it would be my honor. Andrew, as he was being martyred, they said, he walked towards the cross and said, oh, how I longed for you. How I longed for this hour. Marching to the cross, talking to himself. History says, I long for you, old rugged cross. I long till the day that I embraced you and felt what I'm going to feel on that cross. I longed for it. Oh, Jesus, the cross reminds me of your death. And I long for this day. My God, you talk about growing in exceeding great faith. You talk about abounding in love. And all we face nowadays is ourself. We can't get over highs in the church. We can't get over when somebody says something that we don't like in the pulpit. And I know people had a problem with some of the stuff that I said Sunday. But I doubled down on it. I don't offer an apology at all. The Bible is what it is. It is what it is. Well, Homer, I believe you're wrong. Well, I believe you need to read what I, what I quoted about a half dozen times so you can see the mind of Christ in it. I know that some people didn't like it. But it's okay. I can't apologize. And I will not apologize for it. I have three elders in my life that hear what I say. Three of them. And they have all the power and authority to correct me if I said anything wrong. And I will come back the next time I preach and I will apologize. Am I above error? No, I'm not. But my day is spent in that word, man. It is spent in that word. And I'm telling you, and I pray in the Holy Ghost a lot. A lot. So I believe that what I present to you, 99% of the time, is biblical truth. I believe that with all of my heart. So Paul tells Timothy this. He said, I glory in you and in the churches of God for your patience and faith. For all the persecutions that you endure. All the tribulations that you endure. Which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of of God. You may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God by the which ye also suffer. My friends, once saved, always saved is far from biblical truth. He said that you may be counted worthy, that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you also suffer. He said that you may be counted worthy if you face persecution if you face tribulation and if you endure it by faith and patience, you will be counted worthy. But that lets me know when he said that you may be counted worthy. It lets me know that I can deviate from the truth and lose my name out of the Lamb's Book of Life. Because endurance and patience and faith is no matter what I face, Heavenly Father. No matter what I face. No matter what happens to me in this world. I will not deviate from your word. Whether it's the incorruptible seed inside of me. Or whether it's by the written word of God. Father, I understand your grace. I understand your mercy. I understand your compassion. And Lord, I will grow in grace. I will grow in faith. I will abound in love, Father. I won't say it. I won't do it. 
I won't take an offense. I won't clamor. I won't backbite. I won't blasphemy. I won't speak evil, Father. I will mortify my members which are upon the earth. And I will put Christ on regardless of what I face. I'll pluck out my right eye and I'll cast it from me. I'll cut off my right hand and I'll cast it from me, Father. I will do what's right because I belong to you and you have ransomed every bit of my being. That, my friends, is living in Christ, living a mortified life. That's how we grow in faith and how we abound in love towards each other. No other way. You can put as much of God's word into you that you want. If your mind isn't, I'm going to apply the knowledge that I have, you're not presenting your body as a living sacrifice. A person that presents their body as a living sacrifice is one that will do what they know. The Pharisees knew a lot, but what did they do? Nothing but contradict the true gospel of the kingdom. We have to look at the kingdom according to the author and finisher of our faith, Jesus Christ. What did he do? He healed the sick. He raised the dead. He forgave fornicators. He forgave adulterers. He forgave drunkards. He forgave homosexuals. He forgave those that hated him. And those that he forgave were the ones that put him on the cross. He could have easily given up. My God, Father, look at these people that you sent me to. They don't appreciate me, Lord. They don't appreciate my ministry. I want to go back, Father. I want to go back with you. They get on my last nerve. Look at Simon Peter, Lord. He denied me. Look at what he did. He denied me. Judas Iscariot, Father, for 30 shekels of silver. My God, Lord, what did you send me into? Instead, the one that betrayed him for 30 shekels, there was no complaint. It was just a foot washing service. Simon Peter betrayed him three times. There was a look of compassion where Simon Peter left and bawled and cried and wept like a baby because of the eyes of compassion that Jesus showed him. We fail to understand the true gospel of the kingdom. There's no offenses in God's kingdom. We have no right to take them. If we take offenses, we don't understand the cross and the resurrection in Christ in His over glory. We don't understand that. And if by chance we fall, what do we do? First John chapter what? Verse what? Verse 9. We ask Him for forgiveness. But you know what? The days of failure, they should be minimal, 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 minimal. Because we're called to live out of who he is inside of us. A lifestyle of faith. And faith, according to Galatians 2, is he loved us and he gave himself for us. If that's what faith is, then that's how we live. Okay, Rex Marshall don't like me. Uh, Terry and Kirsten don't like me. Barbara don't like me. They don't like the way I preach. That's fine. Don't ridicule me behind my back. Pray for me. Pray, Lord, I pray that he changes his mindset, his disposition about who he is in you, Lord. I don't, no, don't talk about me. Come to me as a worshiper of God. Homer, I have exception with this. I have exception with what you said. I guarantee you if I'm wrong, I will admit it. And I will give you a hug and tell you that I love you. But don't rip me, man. Because in essence, you're showing who you are. <laughs> I'm not your problem. You are, you've examined your own heart and out of your own mouth, you betrayed yourself and told on yourself. Pray for me, man. God, I need prayers. But we have no concept nowadays of what it is to grow in faith or to abound in love because we're too busy being victims. We're too, too busy being victimized by circumstances, by trials and tribulations. We're too busy being victimized with the old me mentality. Lord, I, it just didn't work out. And we're too busy redefining the gospel by our personal failures. 
We're too busy redefining the gospel and the atonement by loved ones that we've lost in our life. Well, it must not be God's will. My husband died. My wife died. It must not be your will to heal, to heal them all. We've redefined it. We've watered down the gospel based on our failures and what we've seen. No. No, I lost my mom and my sister within two years and my dad is not doing very well. It doesn't change that by his stripes I'm healed. I had four strokes and if I die of a stroke tomorrow, which I'm not, that doesn't change the word of God. If I die blind, it doesn't change the word of God. Nothing can change what's everlasting. Nothing can if your husband leaves you, your wife leaves you, it doesn't change the word of God. Situations do not change God's word. That's called patience, faith, and endurance. Father, the circumstances may change, but your word, I cannot deviate from that which is, abides forever. Psalms 125. He that trusted in the Lord is like, like Mount Zion. It cannot be removed. It abides forever. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds them that are His from henceforth and forevermore. We just have no concept of what it is to trust in God. You can't trust God outside of His Word. Psalms 91, your truth is my shield and my buckler. We're quick to quote 91 in 1. For they that dwell in the secret places of the Most High shall abide in the shadow of the Almighty. We quote that real good. We forget that what enforces that is that his truth is my shield and my buckler. A thousand may fall at my side and ten thousand at my right hand and it shall not come back to Why? Because his truth is my shield and buckler. The plague may come my way, it won't come back to Why? Because his truth is my shield and buckler. We quote the juicy part of the scripture, but we don't quote the substance. The substance is his truth is my shield and my buckler. Psalms 18, as for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is right. He is a buckler to all that trust in him. The part of him that we trust is his word that's perfect. We disannul the meat. We cling to the promise, but we disannul the meat of the word. We disannul the meat of what brings the promise. See, it's easy to say, he is my refuge and my fortress. Yes, if you trust in his word. Of course, Psalms 84, he says, and this is powerful. The psalmist knew how to express themselves and who God was in obedience. And, and, and David said this, I think in 84, I believe it is. He said, blessed are they, listen carefully. Blessed are they which dwell in thy house, they shall still be praising thee. Blessed are they which dwell in thy house, meaning that abide in your sayings. Blessed are they which dwell in thy, thy house, they shall still be praising thee. Blessed is the man whose strength is in thee, in whose heart are the ways of them. He says at the end of 84, for the Lord God is a sun and shield. Listen carefully. The Lord God is a sun and shield. He gives grace and glory. Listen carefully. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, blessed is the man that trusteth in thee. We quote the blessing. We quote the miracles, but that which produces the miracles that man or woman of patience, endurance, and faith. We can, we can quote miracles all we want. We can quote revival all we want. And Cry and lift up our hands. But if you're not growing in faith, endurance, you're going to be quoting to the day that you die. I'm telling you, my friends, if we trust the Lord, we shall be like Mount Zion, which is forever. It cannot be removed. Psalms 91, your truth is my shield and my buckler. Psalms 125, I don't understand what it means. And I broke it down in the Hebrew. I called Terry and Kirsten. And because I talked to them a lot about the word. They couldn't figure it out either. Think about this. Lord, you have magnified your word. And the Hebrew word is commandment. You have magnified your commandment above your name. Figure that one out. How can he magnify his word and his commandment above his name? 
I looked up the Hebrew. I couldn't come to a conclusion, but I conclude this. That is powerful. If his word is magnified above his name, God knows we better keep it, man. We better keep it. I know it can't be below his name. I understand to an extent that it parallels his name. But he said, my word is magnified over your name, over your own name. That's hard to comprehend. But what is easy to comprehend is, Lord, if you've magnified your word above your name, oh, buddy, I better keep it. Because there is no relationship with God outside of obeying his word. There's no relationship with God in tears. There's no relationship with God when you hear your favorite song and you weep. Like Gary says, you've created a false Jesus in your mind. Trusting in God's word is a man or woman lives a habitual lifestyle of righteousness. It means nothing else. You do not have a relationship with God unless we know how to endure. Patience, the Greek 5128, quality of character, which is not surrender during circumstance, circumstance or succumb under trial, meaning, Lord, uh, Captain, I won't stop doing your word because I love you, Lord. And I'll grow in faith exceedingly and I will abound in love, Father God, because I've been created, I've been structured to live out of Christ in me, the hope of glory. Homer to the best that I can, Terry to the best that she can, Yolanda to the best that she can, Barbara to the best that she can. We are non-existent. If you are existent, existent, then Christ in you will not be seen. We can't have opinions at all. There are no, I used to say there's three sides to every story. No, there's three, three sides to every story in life. My side, your side, and the truth. In the kingdom of God, there's only one side, and that's the truth. You're not entitled to your opinion. Well, I just want to give, what I, no, 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 what, what you think is irrelevant. In, in a football game, well, I believe my team's better than yours. Well, your team beat my team, but I still think my team's better. That's, that's what most football arguments are about. Well, y'all beat us, so we fumble three times. That's irrelevant and dumb. But my team, we, we, we would have won if we would have scored 48 more points than you guys. Oh, my God. Opinions mean nothing in the kingdom of God. The only thing that matters is the word of God. The word that he magnified above his name. If I think that I have a relationship with the Almighty God outside of Jesus Christ being the Word, I am mistaken in my heart. It's absolutely deceived. Why? Because I do not know God, nor do I obey the gospel of the kingdom. There has to be a reaction to the gospel in our life. There has to be obedience to the gospel in our life. He said... Uh, I'm bound to give thanks unto you, church, at Thessalonica, because your faith, it grows exceedingly. And your love for one another, it abounds. So that I glory in you and the churches in God because of your patience or obedience and faith. You hold fast to God in all. The, in all. He didn't say 50%. He didn't say 75%. He said, in all the persecutions and tribulations that ye endure, which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God, that you may, that you may, that you may, Rosie, that you may, Crystal, that you may, that you may be counted worthy for the kingdom of God in which you also suffer. If you don't also suffer as a child of God, you will not be counted worthy. It says, I think it's Matthew 24, if you endure to the end, you shall be sozo. You shall be saved. If you endure, if you endure to the end through obedience, you shall be saved. Amen? We don't exist in this world. I am crucified with Christ. Galatians 2. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life that Homer lives in the flesh, he lives by the faith of the Son of God that loved him 
and gave himself for Homer. If that's faith, me loving and me giving myself up for you, then that's what I have to live by. Faith is nothing else than standing fast according to the Lord of the Lord Jesus Christ. Faith is nothing else. We have to grasp that. We don't have any rights to take offenses. Now we will give offenses if you're living right. You can't help that. You will suffer persecution if you live godly. You will. But I can show you a sure way not to get persecuted. Just don't live godly. And you will not be persecuted. That's simple. Just don't live godly. Say what you want to say and post on Facebook whatever mess you want to post and you won't get persecuted. Don't. Just do it. Call somebody names, talk about their mama, uh, swear, say the F word on Facebook if you want to. You won't get persecuted for that. You'll blend right on in. But stand firm. Stand firm. Grow, exceedingly grow in faith. Abound in love. And you will be counted worthy. One day that I did hear this man say that really ministered to me, and I'm not saying his name. You weren't just born again for your name to be written in heaven, man. You were born again so that God's kingdom would be manifest inside of you, and you live out of that spirit. That's why you're born again. To live out of who Christ is inside of you. Amen. I have no, I have no beef with the message of love at all. For love is what? The fulfillment of the law. But I do have a problem when one preaches love, 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 love with no message of mortification. And I did a thorough study on this. Thorough. So you can't talk me out of it. I heard, I heard what I heard that doctrine is not that important. Well then the Apostle Paul is a liar. Then Jesus is a fool. Because he said a little leaven leavens the whole lump then our forefathers are liars. Then the Christ is a liar. Doctrine does not matter. It's just the love of God. We're well, not walking in the love of God unless you abide His doctrine. Romans 6 is water baptism. When you were raised from the water, you were set free from sin. That is not true. I was set free from sin the moment I said, Jesus, you are the Christ, the Son of God. Bam! I was quickened from spiritual death unto spiritual life. Nothing and no one can take that away from me. No one can. That is set in stone in the scripture and in my heart. Well, I don't believe he said that. Well, I'm sorry he said it. I heard it myself. I would not lie to you. I heard it myself. 1 John is talking to a Christian struggling to love. No, my friends, he's talking to a Christian and he's talking to a non-believer. That's who 1 John is written to. There's no gray in 1 John. Now he did say perfect love casts out fear the more you obey. But see, this is the thing. There was enough at the rebirth immediately to not, to not ever commit adultery again. And I had questions about certain things in the past. And every one of those questions, whether you're growing in the spirit and so, is being answered right in my midst. And I was off a little bit on some of that stuff. Now I know what, what being perfected means. I know where you're perfected at. But I'm going to meditate a little bit more before I present it. I know where it's at. And I know something in it still has to be built up. I know it. I can see it clearly. I just won't say it because Gary and Pastor Bronx say it. I want to say it when I see it and I'm seeing what they said. Clearly, clearly, clearly I can see it. That's why I never say, I never say unless I know that I know that I know that someone's wrong because I can't see it. I go look for it. I go look for it. We got to be like Bereans, my friend. When we search the scriptures ourselves. Pastor Bronx says you can't be a mockingbird. It's sad to me in closing. The first closing for real, Ralph. Corey, Corey's not here. He's with his mama. First closing for real. 
someone went to somebody and said, you're not preaching what uh, my pastor and this other man preaches. Why? First of all, I'd have a field day with somebody they asked me that. Pastor Bronk says himself, don't say it because I say it. Say it because you see it and then say it. Well, Homer, why aren't you preaching blah, blah, this and that? This person isn't preaching that. This person isn't preaching that. Well, let me ask you a question, young man. Uh, what's the Bible say about it? I don't know, but I don't know what my pastor says. You wimp. Wimp. If I was going to debate the Bible, I'd tear you to pieces. That's not what my pastor says. Well, what's the Bible say? Show me chapter and verse and correct me. Rebuke me with chapter and verse. Let me meditate it. And if I'm wrong, I'll get on my knees and say, I'm sorry. But don't say this isn't what my pastor says. That's wimpy. That's ignorance. You lack knowledge, but you have remembrance of what your pastor said. That, my friends, is wrong. Though you might be right, but that's a terrible excuse. Well, that's not what my pastor said. No, no, no. What do the apostles say? What does Jesus say? Show me the chapter. Show me the verse. Don't be a mockingbird. Dig the scriptures like a Berean. Dig them. See the truth. Don't take my word for it. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 5. Go to Titus 2 about a marriage and profession and what a woman should do with her family or how a man is to treat his woman. Go to, go to these scriptures yourself and look. Don't believe me. Be a Berean. Go and search the scriptures. Go to Romans 6 and see whether I'm teaching the truth to you or not about water baptism. Go to 1 John and read it. Go to 1 Timothy if you don't think doctrine is important. Go over it. Are you being mean? No, I love this man. He has some good things to say. But those three things, they troubled me. But that's not what the Bible says. That is not what it says. Thank God for a lifetime and a lifestyle of praying in the Holy Ghost, man. Thank God. God for that. I thank God for that more and more every single day. I thank God for his word that he has magnified above his name. My God, can we afford not to read it? The last verse of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 is Paul charges, he charges Timothy, I charge thee. Read this epistle to all the beloved brethren. He thought it was vital that the holy brethren would read this epistle. But I can't read. I have trouble reading. No, you're lazy. Stay off Facebook and you can read your Bible. It's harder to post on Facebook than it is to read your Bible. But I just can't read. Mm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But Paul thought it was important for the Holy Brethren to read the book of 1 Thessalonians. He said, make sure that all the Holy Brethren hear this word. They hear this epistle. I hear the pages turn sometimes. Oh my God, man. The hungriest I've ever been in my life is when I did a 15-day fast. And I smelled a pizza. I ate all of it, crust. I licked the grease on the bottom. I think I even bit the cardboard. How can you not long for God's word? How? If he's magnified it over his name, how in the world can you make it? I guarantee you a person that does not read their word lives in the gray. They might not talk like they live in the gray, but I guarantee you they live in the gray. Faith comes by what? Hearing. Hearing. Oh. The pages. Somebody turn the pages for me. Just let me hear the pages. Somebody in your Bible. Oh. That's better than a box of Debbie cakes, man. 
Read your word, man. Pray in the Holy Ghost. Learn how to worship. Learn how to confess. Fast. Pray. A heart filled with thanksgiving. Go in the Psalms. Let the Psalms teach you how to worship. They'll teach you. Psalms 103. Bless the Lord. Oh my soul. And all that is within me. Bless his holy name. And forget not all his benefits. Who forgiveth thee. All thine iniquities. Who healeth. <laughs> all thine disease. Who redeems your life from destruction. Who covers thee with loving kindness and tender mercies. Who fills your mouth with good things. So that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord executes righteousness and judgment upon all that are oppressed. He made his ways known unto Moses and his acts to the children of Israel. Here's the substance. The Lord is merciful and gracious unto all that fear him and do his commandments. See, it's real good to quote the first eight verses, but if you don't keep his commandments, you don't have access to the first eight verses of Psalms 103. We quote the saucy part. Forget the meat, we forget the substance. We have no relationship with God outside of his word. It's non-existent. Walk in the love of God. Absolutely. The love is the fulfillment of the law. But if you get caught way out in love, 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 when you do something wrong, you'll say to yourself, oh, but God, you're so loving. That's happened to people. That has happened. That's happened. Don't you ever forget about that mortification message. And you don't have to be baptized in water to walk in mortification. That's not, thought, that's not, that's not sound doctrine. I got set free 25 years ago at 5 o'clock in the morning. Amen. 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 Glory. Offering, please, somebody. Did I finish early? What time? 8.42. All right. So did somebody put the offerings up, Terry? The buckets, are they up? You are? Okay, auto. Just weigh what I said. Don't strike me down. And dig the scripture. Dig the scripture. Be a Berean. Dig the scripture. Dig them. I try my best to preach what I see. Not by what I hear. And that's my mindset in the kingdom. That should be yours also. Dig the scriptures as a Berean. Amen? Stand with me, please. Father, we bless you and we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the, the Holy Ghost, Father. We thank you for this offering we're about to receive. Father, we thank you for our pastor, for the elders in Tulsa, Father. We thank you more than anything for the Holy Ghost and the edification process. Father, we thank you for your word, Father, for you have magnified it above your name. I thank you, Father, for my brothers, for my sisters, Father. I thank you, Lord, for your grace, for your love that we have one towards another, Father. I thank you that we are a people of patience, of endurance, and of faith. And whatever we face, Father, we grow in you because we do not deviate from the incorruptible word. We thank you for it, Father, in Jesus' name. Everyone said, Amen. God bless you. Love all of you.